Good morning, TLC. Welcome back to our Sunday worship online. Let's pray before we begin. Dear Lord, um, thank you for gathering our spirits here today. Um, I pray that you just bless our worship time and allow us to understand the words and express our worship and praise to you. I pray that you can be with Pastor Albert as he is preaching and that you will guide him to what you want to teach us. Help us to open up our hearts and hear what you want to say to us and open up our ears to um, take that into action when we hear what you want us to learn. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Is the time for scripture reading. Today we have two passages, Revelation 2, verse 1 through 7, and Acts 2, 42 through 47. So Revelation 2, 1 through 7, to the angels of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words to him who hold the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds and your hard work and your perseverance, and I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And if you do not repent, then I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices from the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property, possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple of courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily to those who were being saved. Good morning again. Welcome. I extend my greetings to brothers and sisters of TLC and then all the brothers and sisters who is now now traveling around the world, living in different parts of our TLC members. And also, everyone who joined our worship by watching the video, may God's peace be with you all. 
Let's pray for the church and prepare our heart uh, for God's word. Let's pray. The heaven declares the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we look at the, the blue sky and then bath ourselves with the, your tender sun. We thank you for this beautiful world and that you have allowed us to live in. As we start seeing the, green, the greenery on the, on the yard, we sense the spring. We sense the power of life. Lord, we thank you that the pandemic is gradually eased. We're so joyful to see the decline of the confirmed and the death cases. Though we continue to pray that the vaccination process will be smooth and effective, we pray that uh, eventually the virus will be overcome and, uh, and disappear. And pray that the people in this country and around the world continue to cooperate and to fight the virus. Lord, we pray for our college and graduate students in San Diego out of town. They have been a tremendous force over leading the, the ministries in TLC. May you remember their services and continue to bless their study, campus life, and the ministry. Continue to guide them to follow your step because you have a wonderful plan for each one of them. And pray for Amber, who is going to move up to UCLA. And thank you for the extended time she has with us. Bless her for her study, the ministry, and campus life there. Lord, you call us to be a people, a sent people, to share the gospel, to disciple people around the world. So we pray and for our planning for the summer missions. With so many uncertainties that we can only say that uh, our understanding and knowledge and capability is so limited. But so we call out the master of the harvest to help us to plan. And then so that the gospel can continue to be shared in San Diego, in Chula Vista, and in Taiwan. And those who participated can receive the spiritual blessings. Lord, we also plan, plan for uh, moving our youth, fight the youth fellowships, uh, to be in-person meetings in April. No, I pray that uh, we will have the wisdom and then to get really prepared in all the safety measures that we need to take to ensure everybody's health. We also pray that our communication with the parents will be smooth so that we all feel comfortable for our children to come here and then to enjoy uh, the Christian fellowship and then also learning together. We pray for Mena Fellowship. Thank you for uh, all the wonderful nights of discussions on crazy love. And then as we are moving on to Phil Bienzi's book on prayer, Lord, this is an important topic for us to share and then to edify each other. Continue to bless the ministry and then I invite more people who would like to come and receive the blessings of it. Now we continue to that pass a peace application for CPE level one internship and then bless Theo's internship work at the TLC. Bless his study, bless his work and give him a good mental and physical health so he can do your work. And thank you for the privilege that we can gather together and continue to listen to your word. As we are saddened by the moral failure of some Christian leaders recently. Lord, it is also the time that we take heed about your word for us. There is a systematic failure that caused all of these uh, tragic failures and that, uh, that hurt the church, hurt the, the Christian organizations. So Lord, teach us your word. Open our heart as we are listening to you. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher. 
And I thank you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bill, Ravi Zacharias was involved in Christian apologetics for more than 40 years. And he was also the author for about 30 books in Christianity. Effective apologetic style has earned, has earned him the attention from the evangelical community. He was constantly invited as a keynote speaker uh, in a Christian conferences. However, Mr. Zacharias has a dark side of his life. Four months after his death in May 2020, three women who work for or uh, work, who work at the two day spots he co-owned in Atlanta came forward, alleging that Zacharias, Zacharias had sexually harassed multiple massage therapists therapist over the course of uh, five years. A law firm hired by his organization, RZIM, after four months of invest investigation, confirmed the abuse by Zacharias and uncovered five more victims in the United States. And there were also evidences of a sexual abuse by, this, by Zacharias in Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia. In his computer, the investigators found pictures and videos of hundreds of young women, some of them nude. Bill Hybels was once a senior pastor in a mega church in the Chicago area. This church, back to 2015, has an average of about 25,000 attendees on a single Sunday. Bill Hybels was the, also the founder of the Global Leadership Summit and the author of a number of Christian books, mostly on Christian leadership. In 2018, he was accused by several women who worked for or attended his church of a sexual misconduct stretching back for more than 20 years. He denied all the allegations However, in March 2019, the Washington Post reported that a six-month independence review by four evangelical leaders found out the misconduct allegations very credible. The moral failure of Christian leaders has led to the downsizing or disbanding of their ministries. It does not just hurt their direct victims. It hurts the leader's family as well. It hurts the face of the many seekers. And it hurts Christian community as a whole at a grand scale. The case of Mr. Zacharias and Hybos share something in common. The board of their church and their organization initially all denied, they all sided with their leaders and they tried to discredit the whistleblowers who were bold enough to speak up. The boards were blinded by their face to their leaders and then have failed to hold them accountable. This is not just a personal moral failure. And there is a deep systematic failure of the church and Christian organizations. In the prolonged abuse, there exists significant structural policy and cultural problems admitted by Zacharias organization, RZIM. And therefore, in these cases, the church is responsible. In fact, we are all responsible. Don't we all like to turn the saints into celebrities? And we all responsible when famous Christian leaders and singers that we just praise them, overly praise them. And then so that to make them believe that they are something else, they are, they are, they are something special. And we all guilty 
when these people rob God's glory because we overly praise them more than we praise God. And therefore, in light of this very saddening news, let's re-examine the meaning and missions of the church. As recorded in the Bible, and so that we can make sure that we are living out the identity of a church and then carry out the missions that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. And in today's scripture, in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Apostle John wrote to seven churches located at the western side, western end of Asia Minor. He wanted to strengthen them in uh, the face of a persecution and pressure from the outside world. Christian expect, Christ's expectation is well spelled out in these letters, in the commendations, in the rebuke, in the warnings, and in the promises. And today, I want to cover the John's letter to the church of Ephesus. And it was the focus on what is the true meaning and what is the true purpose of the church. Let me give you a little bit of a historical background about the church in Ephesus. The city of Ephesus, you can see in a map, in the Greek Roman area uh, time, Greek, Ro Greek Roman time, was a city of a with a population of about 200,000. It's a big city in that time. The trading center, especially notable, is the uh, religious artifacts, this industry. Ephesus was the most important city in a Western Asia minor or modern day Turkey. The riches in converse and in a religion enable Ephesus to build a temple dedicated to goddess Artemis, uh, or in uh, called Diana. Uh, Di Temple Diana by the Romans. And today, it is listed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Ephesians were able to construct a theater that could seat uh, about 24,000 people. Now, that was quite some amazing technology in ancient time. However, the level of the morality of, among the, 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 the city population was very low. And then in Apostle Paul's third missionary journey, he worked there for two years and three months, with positive results among the Greek and Jews. God was performing extraordinary miracles through the hands of Apostle Paul. However, Ephesians soon rejected him and becomes hostile to Christianity. Now, all of this background is recorded in Acts chapter 19. Then, what kind of a church is the church in Ephesus? This church in Ephesus has been blessed with powerful, excellent pastors. They were Apostle Paul and they were Apostle John. Now, they are Apostles of Jesus Christ. They pastor the church. And then there's also Timothy, and who served there as a representative of the apostle and also a pastor there. Now, as a church, you cannot, you cannot call any, any stronger, power, uh, powerful pastoral team than Paul, John, and Timothy combined. Not only do they have a powerful pastoral team, they, are also, they also uh, had a good witness by their deeds. And according to Acts chapter 19, efficient Christians once were very engaged people. They're living out the kingdom values of their faith. And their, purp their purposeful life and their purposeful virtue, it caused the city to experience a trans tremendous transformation. People openly confess their sins. And sorcerers openly burn their scrolls. They no longer practice the magic. And all that, all those happen have uh, a cause, has threatened this corrupted religious and political system in the city. Christianity create, caused the world to be upside down in, in, in Ephesus. And the efficient people, efficient Christians, they also have a witness by word. They share the gospel. 
Acts chapter 19 says, The word of the Lord spread widely and grow in power. They have provided this place, the freedom and opportunity to be free from the bondage of a superstition in this ancient world. So what went wrong with the church? You read the, uh, Revelation chapter, chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. Christ used a very harsh word against this church. This is the church who were commended for their commitment to ministries. And in Revelation 2, that we notice that Jesus Christ had very detailed knowledge about their work. Jesus said they had a hard work undertaken for the church's ministry. They work hard for church ministry. They work very hard. It's so hard. And then they're also fighting against the false teachers. Try to stand correctly, theologically. And they were also even willing to suffer for Christ's name under persecution, and then they did not bow down. So the question is, why these things are not enough? Why these things are not enough to please God? As we read on, Revelation told us, it is because they have lost their first love. They have forsaken the love that they had at first. Even though the believers was, were modeled spiritually by powerful pastoral team, but they de began to decline their love for God and the love for people, which is the, the most important commitment from the Lord. They no longer love God and love the people as their first generation used to do. Our genuine love for God instinctively will lead to expression of their love to the neighbors. When we can love our neighbors, that it is our really the expression of our love for, for God. They go hand in hand. And when the church lost her love for God and for people, she has lost her identity. The meaning of a church's existence has already disappeared. Efficient church was a growing church. Perhaps because you're growing, you're growing in size, uh, you are growing your organization and ministries, and people were pro over to manage what is being built. Leaders no longer share the gospel because they are busy to be a caregivers and to be a custodians. And pastors, pastors become a CEO rather than a shepherd. The church will turn the focus into a status quo mode of thought. They may still love God, but they're no longer with their heart, soul, and mind. Now, Pastor Francis Chen once said in his book, Crazy Love, he said, anyone who wants to hear God's word can come to the church free of charge, right? That's what church is about, right? The church is supposed to be free. But as his own church grows to the size of 5,000 people, he found out that it took multi-million dollars to maintain the church. Every year, multi-million dollars to to maintain the organization and then the systems. Much of the energy and then the resources were taken to manage that has already been built. They're fighting their energy to share the gospel, to spread the good news. Francis also said that according to the Bible, everyone in the church all have a spiritual gift and they are supposed to exercise it to build up the church, right? But he found out that every Sunday morning, thousands of people flock to his church only to watch his own gift. Only him get to exercise his gift. And then people just quietly sit there. And after the end of the service, they would go home. Business as usual, as, not, as if nothing had happened. What a waste, he said. There is no church life. There is no exercise of a gift. There is no growing together. How can a congregation love one another if they just come and then they leave after the service? They don't even know each other. That's, one, that's not what a church is about. 
Gary Nelson says, when we lost the passionate love, we have lost the radical purpose of our existence. Talking about the church. The members of a crisis body are no longer a church when they cease to love God and to love people. The efficient church has lost her identity. And this is why the, 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 the Lord's words to them is also so harsh. And as a church, when the church lost the meaning and then the purpose of our existence, watch out. Other things will, will, will take place, will substitute. The congregation will be transformed into an audience. Proclamation now becomes performance and then the worship. The worship will turn into entertainment. And we do see that in a lot of large churches in the United States. They hire professional musicians to do the worship. And then multiple camp campuses, thousands or tens of thousands of people, every Sunday just listen to their charismatic senior pastor to preach. And then they would go home. There's no church life. And then I want to bring your attention to Acts chapter 2, verses 40 to 47. It gives us a picture of the function and the purpose of the church of a meaningful church, and that is the first church in Jerusalem. What was the church like? What was a, church, a meaningful church like? First of all, the church is a worship center of the community. The first is, the church is, should be the worship center of the community. The first Christians met every day, not just a Sunday morning. They met every day to praise God, and they devoted to prayer. Worship, brothers and sisters, worship confronts the life through God's grace. It was a natural expression when we receive God's grace. It should occur every day in believers' life, whether it's individually or corporate worship, not just on Sunday mornings. The efficient church used diligent work to replace the love for God. However, worshiping God should precede doing work for him. Because in worship, we get to know him more, right? And then we have opportunity to express our love for him. We need to have that first. Without that, our hard labor for the church is meaningless because we don't know why we're doing it. And theologian told us that if we do not know why and how to worship and then the blessings in it, it is not appropriate for us to do his work. It's not even appropriate for us to serve. So therefore, brothers and sisters, don't replace worship with the church activities. Pandemic or not, TLC continues to worship. Worship the triune God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Although it is through the worship videos, but the, 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 the spirit is the same. Let's continue our worship at the 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. I encourage every one of you, whole family, bring together, watch the video together, and then prepare your heart just as if you used to do when you have in-person worship. Make that a habit. Set aside a time. So someday when we do allowed, when we are allowed to come back for worship, that you will have a naturally transition. And then because it's Sunday morning at the 10 is the time for corporate worship. And here I also want to take an opportunity to thank our worship team, our technical team. They, they, week, they work here week after week tirelessly and to make the worship video available. The Lord will remember your service. So what is a meaningful church, a purpose for church? It is a worship center of the community and it also is the witness to the gospel in both words and deeds. The church is the witness of the gospel and in the life that resulted from the gospels. And then the church used not only word, but also the deeds to do the witnessing. 
the context of evangelism is not just proclaiming the world, not just proclaiming the word, but also living out the word in life. As we read from Acts chapter 2, the first century Jerusalem church, they were devoted. They were devoted to learn God's word, right? They, they, they learned God's word, so they learned how to be disciples of Jesus Christ, so their life can, can be transformed. And then the life of Christ, the new life of Christ, can manifest in their life. And then you will become a good witness. This church met every day in the, the temple courts. That is a public place. They go to where people are. And then, uh, and then do the teaching and then do the witness there. Apparently, their ministry was successful. Their, uh, their, their testimony becomes attractive to their neighbors. People like the church. People like the church people. And then, and then the Lord added to their number every day those who are saved. That's the purpose and the meaning of life. The summer mission in Taiwan and San Diego and then a homeless outreach in Chula Vista during the past years is the way that our Lord invited us to participate in His missionary works. It is his work, but he invited us, allowed us to participate because of his grace. And brother and sister, because you are willing to go, because you are you willing to bring the gospel to those who have not yet heard it, then many people have the opportunity to hear it in its complete setting, right? And they will be able to commit their life to it. But remember, in return, you grow in closer relationship with God. In return, that you who participated grow in relationship with the master of harvest. You grow spiritually. The mission's work and our spiritual work, our spiritual growth, they mutually edify each other. The more you share the gospel, the more you experience God's power, and, and the, the, the more you grow spiritually, and when you grow spiritually, you love to do missions work even more. The pandemic should not stop our sharing the gospel. We need to create a plan this year's summer mission. And then we need to work around all the difficulties. But in the meantime, continue to share the gospel in your own settings, in your own context. Use your relationship with your family, with your friend, classmates, colleagues. Bring the word to them through your, through your words and then through your deeds. Our church set up Bible studies, Sunday school classes, and daily Bible reading schedule. All of these are trying to help you grow spiritually. And only when you understand the meaning of a worship, only when you have a true relationship with Christ, can you be a good testimony. Can you be a good witness to the community? Prepare yourself as one who constantly share the good news. And that is the meaning of a church. That is the meaning of a Christian life. We are a group of people who are sent by God. And that's John chapter 20, verse 21 says. So the Meaningful Church is a worship center of a community. It is also the witness of the gospel. And then number three, the church is the community that believers share their life together. The church should be a community that believers share life together. The first century church devote themselves to fellowship, as the Bible says. They sold their property, they shared with each other, so nobody was in, the, in, in need. Nobody was in lack of anything. They broke bread in their homes, and then they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. What a wonderful picture of a fellowship, right? Share life, share food together, and then with, with a gladness and with a sincere hearts. Brothers and sisters, 
our witness of the gospel is, will never complete unless the church demonstrates what life is like in the shared life of love and faith. Our witness is never complete until that we can demonstrate to the outside world a community of a faith who share life. What, what does it look like? Let people see the power of a new life when the Christians really love one another. A community of a faith, a community of faith that share life always start at a grassroots level, day to day. They bear with one another, they serve in love and in the forgiveness in the context of a grace. That is a powerful example to the outside world, isn't it? That will create a curiosity. This group is different. And I want to know more about the God who they, who they proclaim. However, we have to admit in the church history, the churches have failed to do that, what God has called us to do, to share life together. Fighting and disunity are the common theme in the church today. In addition, the modern day church cultures have very, very have many individualized Christians who don't share anything with with anybody. The modern phenomena in the in the 21st century industrial environment, people are so busy, they come to the church and then they go home. But brother and sister, how can we grow spiritually when we are all by ourselves? The, 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 the word the fellowship comes from a Greek word koinonia. It depicts a picture that believers can learn from each other, positively influence each other, and they may on occasion involve with correction and rebuking each other. And all of these facilitate the brother and sister to grow together. And for this reason, I encourage everyone encourage everyone to participate in fellowship meetings and reaching out to each other. Call them up, share some food with them, share your Bible knowledge, share your Christian life, care for others. Support others, brothers and sisters, and be supportive. And lastly, the Jerusalem church also represented the reign of God among the neighbors, near and far. They involved their community. They gave it to the poor. And then they earned the favor of their, of their neighbors. They participate in the community so they have opportunity to establish that relationship, to serve them, and then to in order to share the gospel with them. The both, the church, the church is both a messenger and then also a servant of their neighborhood. Before the pandemic, TOC used to collaborate with other churches, organizations to run fundraiser for Kenya. It was a meaningful work. And we would work with, together with more than a dozen organizations and church to raise money for them. And we also do UCSD student ministry with many other churches. We participate in uh, the activity in Taiwanese Cultural Center. This is as a church, as an individual. And then we also reach out to the community. That's what a meaningful church should be like. We don't share the gospel in a vacuum. We don't put our, keep ourselves within the four walls of the church. We bring gospel out. We need to share life with others. And in the letter to the church of Ephesus, Christ diminished the, the, the uh, church in Ephesus to remember where they had fallen. And there was a warning there. Christ admonished them to remember where they had fallen. They need to repent and they need to change. They need to continue to do the deeds that they used to do, the first generation Christians used to do. And if they fail to repent, there's a consequence. There's a consequence. The Lord will take a drastic measure. In verse 5, 
the Lord will remove the lampstand from its place. What does that mean, remove a lampstand from a church? It means that the church will experience a spiritual blackout. The light is gone. The church is no longer a church. They may continue to meet, but they will no longer meet with power. They will no longer meet for the spiritual purpose. They will meet together for the social purpose. And this is why sometimes that we see churches is more like a social club. And then a worship center, then a place to learn God's word, then a place to witness, then a place to share life with each other. At the end of the letter to the seven churches, Jesus reminds every church to take heed and obey what the Spirit has said to the church. What the Spirit has said to the churches, everybody who has ear should listen. So this is it's not just a message for efficient church. This is for a message for every church in our day. We need to be reminded that Christ has won a victory. Difficulties may have it. The conflict and then the trials of our present life in the world and in church may have it. We are still, we still need to do the work. But the promise of Jesus Christ, the promise of Jesus Christ is that those who overcame, will overcome, will be able to eat from the tree of life that is in the garden, in the paradise of God. What does that mean that we can eat from the tree of life? That means we are, as a church, what becomes meaningful, we have, we'll have a life. And as an individual, we'll have eternal life. The promise of eternal life, however, is only given to the overcomer, to the victorious one. And that means what? Every true Christian. It's not about how much work we have done for Christ. How many people that, that we have shared the gospel, it's not about our performance. It's about our relationship, that we are true believers, and then we lift up the kingdom value. We are faithful to God's calling. What is a meaningful and purposeful church? It is a worship center. It is a witness to the, of the gospel in both words and deeds. It is a community of believers share the light together. It is a call for sacrificial compassion service in the neighborhood to the world. So, brother and sister, let's use that to evaluate our own church. Pandemic or not, we are now walk astray. The church will always live out its identity and carry out the mission that God has given to us, Jesus Christ has given to us. In light of a moral failure of the Christian leaders and then the church deviating from her purpose, let's take heed. Let's examine ourselves as a corporate, as a church, and as an individual. Dear brothers and sisters, as a church or as an individual, if we are mobilized and energized, by realizing that we are truly a people of God, that we, see, we understand our identity, right? We're people of God, right? So we, that knowledge can mobilize and energize us. And then we are empowered by the Holy Spirit that we want to live a different life, differently from our community, from those who don't know, don't know Jesus Christ. Then we can apply, if we can apply the values of a virtue, in our faith community and in our daily life, then our people will be very, very curious to this atmosphere that we created. They will ask, who is this God that you serve? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have this wonderful calling for your church. And we are saddened sometimes to see that church is deviating. And then from the purpose and meaning you have given to the church, 
let alone carrying out the missions. In light of the moral failure of Christian leaders, we also see the systematic problem of the church. Lord, we need to come for ourselves. We need to repent. We need to come before you and continue to examine ourselves to see if we truly live up your wonderful calling. Teach us, continue to guide this church, the body of Christ, to continue to follow your steps, to carry out a mission you have given to her. And then, as your promise, that you will give eternal life to those who will overcome, that you will be able to use the church as a light and salt of the community and to bring glory to you and to bless it, bring blessings to those who have not yet known you. We thank you for this wonderful calling. And I pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Let's continue our worship with tithing and offering. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us what we need when we need it. Um, thank you for the cheerful givers. I pray that you use what we have for your kingdom and that it will be in your will. Whatever is used um, will be what's best for your glory. And um, yeah, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. This week's announcements, number one, TLC Attender Loving Care Church has a new logo. It's in the front and the back of our worship video. Thanks to Amber for her artwork. And she will be moving to an apartment soon in LA near the UCLA campus. And we want to pray that the Lord bless her study, ministry, and campus life there. And we're looking for her to return during, to, during our breaks and after graduation. We also are very grateful for many college students who have served our youth and our children, Henry, Amber, Esther, Megan, Stephen, as well as graduates, students, Jenny, and Ifan. Some of them are being moved or will soon move away to college campuses while others stay. May the Lord bless their spiritual and study growth. <laughs> as the pandemic confirmed, Death cases in the U.S. have a sharp decline. According to LifeWay Research, 76% of U.S. Protestant pastors say their church met in person in January. So we're planning our youth to come back in person face-to-face -face in April, and it will be from 4 to 6 p.m. on Fridays. So that'll be after the daylight saving time, so we'll have more light when we're here. We will be wearing our facial coverings throughout the whole time and social distancing to ensure our health. Mana Fellowship is finishing discussions on Francis's, Francis Chan's book, Crazy Love, and starting Thursday, March 18th, the fellowship will discuss the prayer book, a book of prayer by Philip Yancey, and this is a good opportunity to learn about prayer and extended discussions in our prayer life, so please join. That will be on Thursday, at seven and today English Sunday school for high school to adult is at 1120 brother Theo will be leading a discussion on how to interpret the Old Testament narratives and also today at 1120 the middle schoolers will be led by auntie Carrie on the topic of hope this Friday we'll have Ambo leading alpha series for youth that will be friday 7 30 p.m this week's reading schedule bible reading schedule is genesis chapter 25 through 27 and acts chapter 1 through 2. and now we would like to welcome pastor albie for the benediction now if you are able i'd like to invite you to stand up uh, where, wherever you are to receive the benediction Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love from the Heavenly Father, the communion from the Holy Spirit be with you all, from now on until eternity. Amen.